Thank you, uh, Beatrice. Uh, first, uh, thanks for bringing us here together, the Design Museum, for having us here. Uh, Indy, for your uh, kickoff. Um, I'm going to talk about um, design and research, uh, but uh, of course I'll talk about water. Uh, as a water ambassador, it will never leave you uh, at all, and it's, it better b never leave us, because water determines uh, our past, our current, and our future. Um, and we know when we look at the world that we take water for granted. Yeah? Over 70% of the surface of the world is covered with water. But I do a little trick. I take a vacuum cleaner, take all the water of the world. The planet does not become a Swiss cheese all of a sudden. It's just a little, a little cover like paint on a wall that is water, because all the water of the world is now captured in that large sphere. But if you look closely, there are three spheres, and the smallest one, the one you can hardly see, is all the water that we can use. We, for human consumption, food, for instance, but also for industry, energy supply, etc. Water is scarce, although we think there is enough of it. Right now, in this water cycle, what we are talking about, is the thing that we're actually wrecking. And it is at the heart of every crisis that we face. Normally, we only look at blue water, yeah, the water that we can see and touch and drink and feel, and it's in our oceans. But the most important part of water, perhaps, is green water. The water that comes through our soils, through our plants, into the atmosphere. Evo evapotransportation is really meaning supercharging that atmosphere. And that atmosphere supercharges climate change and its impact. So water is at the heart of that, and we're losing it. We can't count on water anymore. We're because we, humans, are changing the source of fresh water. The assumption that we have that we can count on water for food, energy, health, and well-being is no longer there. And the other thing that we have to think about is the scale. And I think this is also true for design. Eh? Water is always seen as something very local for your family and community. It's in your watershed, it's in your river, your lake, perhaps you think about an ocean. We thought of it as local and then regional and across borders. But it turns out that because of green water and these atmospheric flows, we have atmospheric rivers connecting continents. So addressing water in only managing it on a local scale will actually not lead us to a, a, a revamped hydrological cycle. Subcontinental scale for water is key. And it means we create water deficits in places like the Amazon, that impacts the Congo, Canada, and the rest of Latin America, impacting markets, our economies, and societies, making the most vulnerable even more vulnerable, and cutting across those securities that we think we can rely on, being food, energy, and waste. We all know that we are crossing these boundaries. Indy talked about how that future that is our nightmare is already there. And you see, in the last 14 years, we're already crossing six of the nine planetary boundaries, worked by Johan Rockström. Without fresh water supply, there is no food, there is no energy, there is no health. All those sustainable development goals and a Paris agreement that we drafted and tried to agree on and deliver on, which we fail, is not within reach without that water. So we have to rethink growth through the lens of water, and that is why we set up this Global Commission on the Economics of Water, the third after Stern and Das Gupta. But water is also very personal and local. In the pandemic, we all said, wash your hands. For two billion people in the world, that is not possible. They do not have access to safe drinking water. Three don't have access to sanitation hygiene facilities. And four billion people, half of the world, do not have a safe place for, uh, sa for sanitation. And it means that Next to this global issue of water, and it's connected to climate and the way it's impacting our biodiversity and health, it is a very local and personal issue and determines our security. I can put up many slides like this. This is 2023 and 2024. I can go back years. We have disasters that are vamped by water. Water insecurity is driving climate change and its impact, with floods, droughts, wildfires, only increasing, and that water in insecurity driving climate change makes us think we have a problem. Well, forget about it. This is not a problem. This is a complexity of problems that will never be dealt with by these white male men that were sitting in a room in Houston when something went wrong out of space. 
It is a time that we have to fundamentally rethink what science and therefore design is in the context of this complexity. It also is, means that it, you know, we can't deal with science in this complexity only by numbers. It has to be done by empathy and compassion. It is, like Secretary General Guterres says, a time for the connection between what we know and need to know and want to know and who do we do this for and with and the way to work together. Design has to dare to understand that complexity, embrace it as an opportunity. Um, IPCC, International Panel for Climate Change, drafts many reports. I think the design guidebook for the planners is the one, perhaps, uh, Climate Change and Land from 2019. It's a little bit forgotten, but it tells two frightening messages. One, over 99% of our global investments increase climate change. And second, those investments make us more vulnerable every day with every dollar spent. Because our books are wrong, our economies are wrong. There is a business case for stupid infrastructure that actually makes us more vulnerable with every dollar spent. It's very easy. Eh? If we follow the money and the way money is accounted for, we'll only end up in the worst world ever. But we have these amazing agendas that we agree on. 17 SDGs, not as, as, as a sectoral or a fragmented approach, but as a holistic agenda for the future. A Paris Agreement, a biodiversity agreement, another agreement coming from Dubai. But by design, we have to overcome this lock-in in society that we're not achieving our goals. We're not reaching for that future. It's like we have this massive bulldozer only pushing fossil fuel shit down the road and making it worse for all of us while we achieve for the moon or from the moon to the planet. We go from yesterday to today to tomorrow in a path that we think is comfortable taking with the risks in a very reactive way. We have to rethink how that future looks like and bring it back home. Bring it back today, land by design, that research and understanding of that complexity and the actions we can take on a daily basis. But that can't come slow. And I'm, I, of course, Tintin is not perhaps the best reference for going fast, I know, but I couldn't found a, find a better character of a, of a rocket because rockets are fossil fuel too. But we have to move fast in this context of reimagining the future and bringing it home and going forward again. Business as usual is not only long, is not, not longer, not enough. It's lethal with every dollar we spend in that. But there's hope yeah, from non-responsive, from crisis to crisis, to now predominantly being reactive, responding to everything that's on our way, to becoming very proactive. Proactive in the sense of understanding that future and thinking through as an opportunity. Again, water helps because it's connected to everything. Water is in life. It's in our health, in our biodiversity, in our plants and foods and energy. Nothing can work without water. And because of this connective capacity, and if we understand value and try to manage it, it can drive solutions that are literally holistic, comprehensive and inclusive and deal with justice at the same time that they deal with sustainability and resiliency. But that means we have to look at the long term. Long term in a very comprehensive way and at the same time act upon that long term now. That long term and that now are connected in a way that is consistent, continuous and with a commitment that we continue to do so. I, I think it's important that we try to do all these tests and innovations and laboratories and then we go back to normal again. But that consistency of change has to drive programmatically everything we do. If we do this transparent so that we can learn, and again here, research and the design play in, if we do this in a transparent way, we can learn from how this works, building capacity. That learning and transparency is, is key. It's also key for validation. Since our books are wrong, we have to reimagine how we validate and value how we work. And that transparency and the way how those metrics work have to change. Inclusiveness and justice in the context of building capacity. That capacity is institutional, it is across coalitions, but it's as much individual. And I think, you know, I'm not a designer, um, although I, 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 I work with designers and I, I had a, a partially a design background, but I learned that design brings a type of magic and with that a type of responsibility. 
For one, it's, it helps us imagine those solutions that we need, that are different, that can bring us from today. Yeah, water. Yeah, this is, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, should have told you, yeah. Um, it's um, broken now. We have to be more careful with water in the museum. Uh, uh, tap water is also fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. Uh, <laughs> at the right moment. Design with a bam, you could say. Don't drink it anymore with that glass. Uh, design is powerful because it helps us imagine those solutions. And those solutions are, of course, innovative, but at best catalytic that they can drive change. And design is the cap has the capacity to connect, looking at social, environmental, cultural, economic, individual questions, across scales from your front yard and your home all the way to your river basin and across the globe. I think this combination of being practically driving uh, change, as well as figuring out how these connections work, is important. And last, design is you know, it's ambitions in a way that it can help us reimagine that future, but also can talk to politicians in a different way. The decision makers, public and private, in a community, all the way until the institutions. Reimagining that future demands guts. We need to dare to reimagine that. And that ambition and aspiration is critically needed for a future that we want. It's okay, you can leave it for now. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. So, at design in the way to drive solutions, have the capacity to connect and provoke the status quo of decision making and validation is going to be key. But it's also about the process. And I think here the world around also comes in. Organizing the conversation and building that capacity by bringing design in for the, uh, d designing that alternative is as much a part of designing the process moving forward. We need safe spaces, because we trust is lacking, uh, injustice and inequalities are all over. Bringing partners together, uh, uh, stakeholders or individuals in one room, doesn't immediately lead to salvation. Uh, uh, not, uh, you know, we see it around the world, more conflict, more inequality. So the safety of a space is key and design can help create by understanding, by assessment, by research, but also by provocation and inspiration, safety for that space. Safe places are needed, and through the uh, work I led for President Obama after Hurricane Sandy, we created these safe spaces where, against all odds, Republicans and Democrats, um, individuals and uh, the most vulnerable, were put together uh, with financiers, bankers and private sector to reimagine a future. That was a moment, moment in the context of a post-disaster hurricane, Sandy, uh, now uh, 12 years ago, led by a president who actually believed in facts, institutionalized research in the context of those challenges. We built a safe space called Rebuild by Design, bringing together the world in the context of reimagining the future of that region. I'm not going to talk about it by the book. Uh, I'm going to talk about Asia, because uh, I only have 20 minutes. Um, Sandy was post-disaster, and in that sense, it was a reactive approach in a proactive manner. Uh, we went to Asia and looked at using design to understand the challenges in the context of the Asian cities. 30 cities we assessed on, on all the challenges they face in their environmental context, from flooding to subsidence, from droughts to pollution, from energy deficiency to population growth, demographic changes, and across. And these hotspots, we were able to identify three and work with Chennai in India, Kulna in Bangladesh, and Samarang in Indonesia. Again, creating a safe space where we brought together communities, individuals from those cities, community organizations, city officials, uh, officials from government, private sector, but also individuals, uh, international organizations, financiers, and across, to reimagine together design-driven the opportunities. Literally on the streets of these cities, doing the workshops, the understanding and figuring out how water could be a driver in the context of climate change and sustainability. Six teams worked across these cities. Some examples of their research are out there. Rethinking how water could be a driver for the change needed. I'll 
name one is from the Oost team, architecture firm from Rotterdam, led by uh, Sylvain and uh, uh, Eva, and they assessed the water system in Chennai. This is the coastline of Chennai, the hinterland, uh, it's uh, surface water rivers, um, and uh, currently now, the, the way water falls in the monsoon, the monsoon is becoming shorter, but the massive amount of water that falls is more than enough to feed the city, but the city is, sur the surface is hard, the, the channels look like this, so the water is polluted. If you pump water from the ground, it's black, uh, and uh, you can't use it, so it's overused. Subsidence comes with it, as well as uh, uh, becoming more saline through seawater, so there's nothing to use. So actually, everything that you have, the water from surface water and rainwater, is wasted and polluted. It's a system that is broken. What does the government do? Uh, increasing debt for their city by investing with loans in massive desalination plants on the coast. Desalination is also a cover-up word because it, you know, desal, you would think taking salt out of the water, it's actually taking everything out of the water. So it's actually nothing anymore. Then you have to put the good things back in and uh, the brine, the, the, the lethal leftover is poured back into the ocean creating an environmental disaster. At cost of energy and investment, fossil fuel burned with massive carbon footprint. So you have two diesel plants invested with a large loan uh, uh, from an international organization, and then you have to pump that water through the system. So it's broken. But if we look at how you can mend that system in a circular approach, really thinking through what water could mean on a very local, uh, local level, it is through nature-based solutions at that very local scale, looking not only at water provision and security, but also at flood prevention and drought prevention and sanitation and mitigating heat island effects by taking measures that are inspired by the past, the culture, and the future. Historic tanks were built to save the water and bring them back here. Uh, temples next to them, to the aquifer. New tanks revitalize the channels, building bioswales, constructed wetlands, recycle water and waste at the same time and adapt their buildings. One project uh, is the water balance pilot that we were able to implement in the years that we were working there. For a school for the blind and deaf, the Little Flower Convent. Um, it was opened this summer and it really takes all the water from the community, sewage and storm water, collects it in nature, with nature based solutions, cleans it and recharges the aquifer while at the same time and it's used for the consumption that is needed. Recharging rainwater into that aquifer creates an, an amazing public space for the kids to live, play and work and at the same time all that water is cleaned back into the ground. Uh -huh. An example, small at scale, that reduces a carbon footprint with 80% is a third less in investment and half of the cost of maintenance and operations. We did the same in the cities of Samarang and Kulna. These opportunities where that future is reimagined and implemented and acted upon is something we have to scale up across the world. Really rethinking how we can mend that hydrological cycle. And by accident, this week I was in Europe, but also in Hamburg, in the Design Museum in Hamburg, an exhibit opened, uh, uh, curated by Jane, Jane Ritter's studio. Uh, I was on the advisory panel, so uh, I went to the opening uh, for a panel. And Eva and Sylvain were there also with the project. I'm going to show now eh, another example on how a challenge on the very local scale is actually um, supercharging the ideas on the, on the massive scale. These, this is Eva and Jane in the hallway. And the museum gave us the assignment to make the building um, waterproof, you could say, future-proof. And they said, it's impossible. We can't make a building future-proof. We have to look from the building to the surroundings, to the city, and then they went to the whole Elbe River Basin, which actually stretches from Czechia all the way to Germany and in Hamburg. And they were working on this project and rethinking, hey, how this water cycle works on the very local scale, uh, but looking at how the groundwater is worked, how you can re recharge and recycle and reuse that water, uh, renewable energy based, and at the same time looking at this massive scale of this Elbe, rethinking how forest and green water work and how rethinking a future for this whole river basin across 
borders in this part of Europe can actually help rethink how food is organized, how energy is produced, how we build our cities and our landscape and how we maintain our forests and how we deal with all those climate and environmental and justice related risks. They came up with a program of work. It's not up to me to explain you everything, eh? but they really looked at food and water, uh, floods, uh, how the soil is so important in the context of organizing a safe and just environment, where water is distributed and how fair is it and how, where justice comes in. Uh, there are um, uh, uh, stones that were put in the landscape in the past that when the river was very low, there were hunger stones. So when the, people, the farmers saw the stone, they realized a drought is coming. Those stones are all there now. We, we in, in Europe uh, face massive drought. So reimagining cultural uh, landmarks in the context of preparing for that future. Now, are these designs in themselves enough? No, they're incidents. Eh? IPCC report says that over 99% of global investments increase climate change. Designing the alternative has to become the alternative. We have to mainstream and institutionalize that alternative, otherwise it will never work. There is no silver bullet. It will work differently in every place, but at the same time, changing the economics around it is going to be key. Guterres is clear, but he's not successful, you could say. We brought the world to New York for a UN water conference, 11,000 people, but the follow-up of, of this, this is now lacking behind. Figuring out how that action agenda that was brought together with all those massive and amazing examples, mainstreaming them, them becoming uh, that from an alternative, the mainstream is a role where design can play. Collective action is essential to think through the new economics of water and our environment. We have to do this together in a, in a manner that we're able to address all these challenges together. Integrated and holistic, and I think by design. In September, we'll present our final report, and in the meantime, read my book. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>